In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So celebrated preacher and now professor Tom Long uh, of the Presbyterian tradition was talking about a class that he uh, decided he needed to teach. Uh, as he kind of surveyed his congregation, he realized uh, that many of them were bereft of much of the basics of our Christian faith. And so he decided that he was going to develop a curriculum and put together a class uh, for the congregation uh, about all of the A, Bs, and Cs of our faith. And so he did so. He advertised it for several weeks. Uh, and to his disappointment, on the first day, uh, there were only three people. They were all young girls. That didn't dissuade him. He began and he started to teach his class. And then uh, the next week, he was uh, advertising again, hoping for a lot more to show up. And, he, and it was still the same three girls. And by the third session, he realized that this was his class. Uh, so he began to teach them about Pentecost, about the Holy Spirit. He started telling the story, and he got particularly into it. He talked about how they were all in Jerusalem, uh, and it was an electric time. It was one of the three occasions to come to Jerusalem. It was the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days. Uh, for us now, it's 50 days after the resurrection. Uh, but originally, the Feast of Pentecost was 50 days uh, after the celebration of the Passover. Uh, and it was an occasion where they came not only to, uh, uh, to give thanks for the harvest, for the winter wheat, uh, but also to celebrate the gift of Torah that Moses received, uh, those first five books of, of Hebrew scripture, the Torah. And so it was an electric time, and people from all of the various Jewish traditions, uh, from different languages and different places, all gathered around Jerusalem. And then he described the wind as it came in. Uh, and swept through the area, and he described the, 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 the giant flames that formed on each of the disciples' heads, and the incredible excitement of everybody as all of a sudden, Scripture, for the first time maybe of their, in their lives, was opened up in their native language, and they could understand exactly what was being said, and not just about uh, their Jewish tradition, but about this person, Jesus, and what he meant to the world. And everything that had been separated Going all the way back to that Tower of Babel uh, where humanity tried to, to equal God and, and, and then was separated to the far reaches of the world and separated by language was drawn back together. And in that glorious moment, the Holy Spirit swept over the place. People were baptized and truth was proclaimed and no longer was one group of people considered God's special people. All people were regarded not only as brothers and sisters to one another, but beloved children of God. And as he's pounding his fist and describing this incredible moment in the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the girls raises her hand and before called upon says, Man, I can't believe I missed that Sunday. It... <laughs> and Tom Long was so taken back by that taken back by the fact that that young girl believed that that could have happened at her church in this day, in this age, that it put Tom Long on his bottom. And he said, do I believe? Do I believe that that could have happened at my church? But it begs the question, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? What do we believe is possible? I've been thinking about this, and I have three things I want to leave you with. The first that I believe that the Holy Spirit is more than a way that we catalog God. Uh, it's more than just uh, so that we have our creed in three discrete paragraphs so that we can have the God who we see in creation, who created the whole world, uh, the God who came in the form uh, of Jesus, and then the God for everything afterwards. I think the Holy Spirit is a lot more than that. I think the Holy Spirit is that God is alive and well in the world, that God is continuing to work in the world, that no matter what we see outside these doors, that we know deep down in our being that God is not finished. That the deeper we are to despair, the more assurance and hope we have to have that God is always at work and always bending the universe towards good, towards God's vision. That that is alive and well. We have that story from Ezekiel, and uh, it's worth knowing about Ezekiel that he was a captive in exile from his promised land. 
from the promises that Jesus made, I mean, that God made to his people, uh, that there would be a land uh, that, was, that was held for them, that God's chosen people would inherit this land. And because uh, of, of a failure to follow the law, uh, they were exiled, they were conquered, and he writes from prison uh, about whether or not the restoration of that was ever possible. Whether or not those bones, those dry bones, not just any bones, dry, dead for a long time bones, could be drawn back together into something that has life? Could God's promise be fulfilled again? Was there still hope? And God says, look at those bones, those dry bones. Prophesy to him. The great thing is God tells him that he's part of the healing of the universe. He's part of that hope, that restoration. He says, you prophesy. You can do it. I need you to do it. And as he prophesies, those bones start to come together, and those bones take sinew, and the sinew takes flesh, and all of a sudden, these bones rise up to life again. God is in the world. That also brings me to the second part. The second thing I want you to hold on to, or at least that I believe is deeply true about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit needs us. Just like the Holy Spirit needed Peter and his disciples, just like the Holy Spirit needed Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit needs us, and we need one another. You may have heard this story before, but a pastor uh, goes to visit a parishioner who hasn't been at church for a long, long time, and he knows there's some things going on in his life. Um, and he goes into the, the house of the, of, of, of the parishioner, and he sits beside him, and he just kind of sits quietly waiting, waiting for this parishioner to tell him what's on his mind. A few minutes go by, and he's still patiently waiting with that look of anticipation, that look that I'm ready to hear whatever it is you need to say, and, and still nothing. The pastor still doesn't say a word. Eventually, the pastor walks over to the fireplace. He takes one of the little red embers in the fire he takes it with the tongs and he puts it right there at the edge of the hearth. And he goes and he sits down. And that red ember starts to dim. The red disappears and it turns to ash. And he says to the man, he said, we miss you. We need you. And you need us. And he gives him a hug and he leaves. We need one another for the Holy Spirit to burn. We need one another to hold each other accountable, to discern whether it truly is the, the call of the Holy Spirit, to encourage us when we hear the Holy Spirit, but the world says we're not ready. And we come together and we worship, and we don't just receive Jesus Christ, we receive the power of God in the world today. And we're immediately sent out through those bright red doors to go and do God's work, to be God's Spirit in the world, to be like Ezekiel, and to wrap flesh and sinew and life around hopeless bones. And the third thing, the third thing that I take from today is that the work of the Holy Spirit is found in the story from Acts. It's not just exhibit A of the power of the Spirit or, or just one of the Spirit's party tricks that... Uh, that it happened the way it did, I think it's to the very core of what our mission is and what God's deep desire for the world is. That divisions be broken down. Whether they be divisions of language, divisions of culture, divisions of geography, divisions of color, divisions of what neighborhood we grew up in, uh, divisions of politics, divisions of the hurts that we've caused one another. God is in the restoring, the healing, the unifying, the drawing together. That's the business that God is in. And when we have those opportunities, we know that we are participating in the Spirit of God. God wants us to work towards that kind of reconciling, that kind of healing, that kind of learning, that kind of discovery about our brothers and sisters. And I can't help but think that the, 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 the cafe today was an example of the Holy Spirit at work here at St. James and with First Baptist. Just people of different color coming together doing what Jesus did uh, with those that were beloved, uh, with those that were reviled, with those that he wanted to say, you are my brother and you are my sister and I love you. They broke bread together. They shared each other's story. They knit their stories into each other. 
I can't help but think it is a definitive act of the Holy Spirit that we come here despite our political and social differences, despite what we may post on Facebook or despite uh, what other differences that we may have. But when we come to this table, we claim as we walk to the table that we are one. And we don't just claim it. We work towards it. We share our differences in our lives together. And I believe that our work in Haiti, our work in Haiti is another piece where we are saying we are one. The Holy Spirit burns deeply in us, and we desire to know more about you, to reconcile or to draw together those differences. And I will say, one of the most difficult things about going to Haiti is that it isn't as easy as that story in Acts. I look at children who look a lot like our children, who I teach a hundred times over chapel stories and, uh, and work with, and I see the same excited eyes and the same desire to make connections, and I realize the difficulty that our language differences uh, uh, cause, and I realize the differences between uh, our economies and, and, and the ability to get uh, uh, resources back and forth, and I realize that the Holy Spirit sometimes calls us to roll up our sleeves to dig in a little deeper and to realize that that is God's sacred work. It's what we're called into being. So I encourage us on this Pentecost day, the day that the fire and flames uh, uh, shone above people's heads, that we take our little ember. And we put those embers together and we do what Bishop Curry reminded us uh, uh, we have the capacity to do yesterday uh, during his sermon at the royal wedding, that we take our flames together and we realize that that gift of fire is one of the most incredible Incredible gifts in the universe. Because of fire, people were able to eat sanitary food. They were able to live in places thought inhabitable. They were able to get to the royal wedding, whether by automobile or train or, um, uh, or, or by boat. That they were able to Instagram and Facebook and see the wedding from halfway around the world. That all these miniature explosions of fire have changed the world forever. But he also said, he says, if we harness the power of God, of God's love and God's spirit, fire will be created all over again, and it'll be like nothing the world has ever seen. It'll be like Ezekiel breathing life into those dead bones. It'll be like the Pentecost story that that young girl believed actually could happen inside her church, in her world. It will be the revealing of God's vision for the world, for all to see. So breathe deeply. Take in that spirit and let it burn inside of you. Amen.